For me, this topic is somewhat personal because um, I trained as a vet, uh, but then I did my PhD on cryptosporidiosis in children. And so there was um, very much a desire on my part to try to understand what the animal contribution to cryptosporidiosis was. And much to my disappointment in Uganda, um, most of the transmission was human to human transmission and therefore the animal relevance wasn't so clear. Um, so I think I've been on a, a bit of a quest since then to try to link these two parts of my uh, background. And uh, in the last few years, this area of, of, of trying to understand the animal contribution to WASH and trying to transform WASH into something else um, has, has emerged much to my excitement. <laughs> So I've decided to um, add a subtitle, the story so far, because it's very much a new area. And um, although it's something that's been talked about for some, some time, the actual sort of evidence and, and interest in developing evidence is only starting to, to emerge in the last several years. I'm trying to move to the next slide, but I can't. Uh... Nope, it's okay. So just to um, start thinking about where WASH and, um, and animals fit into this overall um, concept. So what we're really talking about here is trying to improve child undernutrition. And this is the, the UNICEF conceptual framework for maternal and child nutrition. And you can see it focuses on two major intermediate causes, inadequate dietary intake in the middle here and disease. Most of the interventions on the inadequate dietary intake focus on trying to improve infant feeding practices, so increasing the intake and the quality of nutrients that are taken in. Um, whereas on the other side, we have uh, largely WASH, which is, is the main vehicle for pr promoting um, uh, prevention of, of diarrheal illness. Um, just before I sort of go on and focus much more on, on the, the WASH side, just to say that within this One Health space, there's obviously a lot of interest in thinking about and developing the evidence base for um, the role of animal source foods, so promoting eggs, milk and meat in the diet of children and, and where that goes. Um, but I think in the interest of time, I decided I really wanted to focus on the WASH story and, and take that area uh, further forward. So WASH, just to make sure we all have a common understanding of, of what that is. Um, WASH stands for Water, Sanitation and Hygiene. That's the, the little a, there is no actual a in WASH at the moment. Um, and the major aim of WASH is to prevent human exposure to enteropathogens. And that's achieved largely through promoting interventions that focus on safe drinking water, so chlorination of, of water, for instance, uh, improving sanitation, um, and, and this is largely done through promoting use of latrines and reducing open air defecation, uh, and then also promoting hand washing uh, behaviours. Wash is not just about preventing diarrhoea, although as something that's observable, um, without the use of laboratory measures, that's one of the ways that we often focus on measuring the success of, of uh, WASH interventions. But actually, there's a, a perhaps in, more insidious element to this, which is environmental enteric dysfunction. And this is um, a pathology that occurs in children um, where the just this constant immune stimulation and pathogen um, uh, overload in, in the gut leads to pathological changes. Uh, as you can see on the left, we've got the villi that are usually responsible for absorption of nutrients. And when children develop uh, environmental enteric dysfunction, the, the villi become flattened and um, the capacity to absorb nutrients is re much reduced. And so this is, is believed to be one of the, the causal pathways to, to growth faltering. So environmental enteric dysfunction is common in low income countries and we don't really understand what it's caused by, but we do know that it's linked to this chronic exposure to contaminated food and water. Um, it's possibly associated with some specific infections or maybe even chemical contaminants, but because there's no real understanding of, of the mechanism, we 
there's no treatment guidelines for, for preventing um, enteric dysfunction. And therefore there's an emphasis on, on WASH as the primary way in which we um, attempt to modulate exposure to uh, uh, contaminated water, for instance. There's been a few studies over the last couple of years um, that have been quite important in trying to advance our understanding of the relationships between pathogens and diarrhea and diarrhea and growth faltering and pathogens and growth faltering. Uh, I'm not talking about the GEM study here, but, but that would also be another contributor to this space in which they actually found cryptosporidium was quite a major component to um, diarrheal burden. But what I wanted to focus on here is the MALED study and why it was quite novel was through uh, incorporating molecular diagnostics. So, you know, people have been researching this diarrhea and malnutrition area for, for decades, and that's often focused on um, enrollment of children with diarrhea or enrollment um, plus testing of diarrheal specimens with, um, uh, you know, microbiological methods. Um, so, you know, culture, lab-based culture, for instance. But in recent decades, we've seen a shift to the use of molecular methods, and this is making it a little bit clearer about the total burden of pathogens that might exist within children, both who have diarrhea and who don't have diarrhea. And so the MALED study, which was um, published in 2018, uh, found actually that subclinical infection had a bigger impact on linear growth than diarrheal episodes so far. And they were able to identify uh, that four particular pathogens, Shigella, E. coli, Campylobacter, and Giardia, all of these were um, in particular associated with subclinical infection that could contribute to um, declines in linear growth. So it, it really presented quite a different picture versus this idea that um, we needed to reduce diarrhea as the main way and main pathway to promoting value, uh, promoting um, approaches to reduce malnutrition. I'm going to mention the CAGE study later, um, just to highlight that that's where this fits into this. It, it's focusing on Campylobacter, which is, is, and it was identified as an important enteropathogen in this study and others. So coming now to the evidence for WASH. So WASH has been promoted for decades as being, you know, the, the public health intervention of choice for trying to impact on this pathway between um, disease and malnutrition. And there's been some evidence over the years that WASH reduces diarrheal incidence, but largely this has come from observational studies. The WASH community was somewhat rocked a few years ago by the publication of findings from um, three randomised controlled trials that were very well, well designed. They, they measured that, you know, WASH intervention compliance was high and they were able to, to um, you know, document that actually, you know, the WASH intervention was, was present in these communities. But they found in all three sites that there was no impact of these WASH interventions on linear growth. Uh, and in two of those sites, there was no impact on diarrhea incidence. So the only place where there was an impact on diarrhea incidence was in Bangladesh. They also found that there were some reductions in uh, infection burden, but infection rates were still very high. In fact, you know, it was still something like four to 10 times higher uh, infection carriage, pathogen carriage in, in these children compared to children in high income uh, countries. So the authors of these um, uh, studies got together and published a, a paper that sort of presented the combined results of these papers as well as their individual findings. And they concluded that, you know, findings from their trials indicate that even when you have rigorously implemented WASH programs, you cannot assume that it's going to achieve the impact on child and physical health, um, which they're usually, you know, as, assumed to address. And UNICEF and WHO uh, accepted these results. They, they, you know, confirmed that they thought that the, the findings were, that the studies were well designed. Um, and in essence, they concluded it's unlikely that, that these interventions are actually interrupting transmission um, across all of the different pathways that, that are needed to uh, reduce this um, exposure to fecal pathogens. 
I'm going to mention the SHINE trial a little bit later, but just to mention again, uh, this is in the study that was done in, in Zimbabwe. So for some time, people have been talking about this possibility that maybe there is a missing pathway through um, the fact that WASH is seeking to have an impact on, on, on children and growth, um, but it's overlooking a major behaviour of children in critical age groups, namely that they put anything in their mouth. Um, so in, in Zimbabwe, for instance, when they started to, to do some observational studies on, on children to understand what are the kinds of things that children are putting in their mouth, you know, they found that it was, as you would all know, they're, they're very commonly putting handfuls of soil into their mouth and quite commonly in these um, traditional African village kind of settings, they're also putting chicken feces into their mouth with some quite frequent occurrence. And so combined, the intake through soil and chicken feces of bacteria is actually going to be much greater than in, um, you know, water that hasn't been treated with chlorine. So, but but the uh, the actual wash intervention is not at all addressing this um, this particular area. So that led some people to propose baby wash. And again, this is something that's been around now for I think you know, five to maybe 10 years, but, but, but not much longer, um, which was this belief that WASH needs to take a more age appropriate focus on infant feeding and the play environment of children. So rather, you know, in a rather straightforward way, they've incorporated um, modules on food safety and food hygiene education for, for women. But where this area has really gotten a bit stuck is trying to figure out how do we separate infants and toddlers from animal feces. And in, in other words, they're trying to have an impact on this pathway, recognizing that you know, this, this exploratory play and hand to mouth behavior of children is always going to be there. Um, trying to make sure that children's hands are clean. You know, you can't stop the child from putting their hand in their mouth. That's not a, a realistic intervention. But perhaps we can do something about the environment or the child's environment in particular to, to ma make sure that their hand, when it goes in their mouth, is actually much cleaner. So the SHINE trial actually uh, attempted to, to look at this. And um, in the first instance, they thought to design an intervention that would focus on corralling chickens. And in their formative work, they found that this was not likely to be feasible. The, the community members identified chickens as being free roaming, um, you know, low input systems that didn't uh, require any um, significant degree of maintenance. And so, um, if we put them in a cage, they would need to be fed and they would need to be treated for, for parasites and that was deemed not to be access, uh, acceptable. So believe it or not, having ruled out corralling the chickens, the intervention that they pursued was to corral the children. And uh, this playpen here is exactly what they used. They did some formative research that confirmed that, um, that parents weren't totally keen on the idea because children, you know, they were concerned that children won't have enough room to experiment and uh, children eating soil, it was believed, was a fundamental component of their, their um, you know, immune system development. Um, but with education, they, they found that this was, was at least an acceptable option. And, um, and so in the SHINE trial, in addition to standard WASH, they trialled corralling children in these commercial play pens and a protective mat. Um, along with this educational event intervention around baby wash. But as I mentioned, the SHINE trial as well showed that there was no beneficial effect of these interventions on child uh, diarrhea or on child growth. And in general, it was felt that this was just, you know, they were stretching. They were really trying to come up with an intervention just to test and intervene in this area, whilst recognising that people probably would not be able to afford um, some sort of commercial playpen and such as this. There's been a bit more work to try to come up with more of a local way of corralling children. Um, so some other pilots in Zambia, for instance, where they've looked at constructing um, community play pens, again, with the idea of putting children in there when the mother is off working. Um, but some of the ideas that, that they encountered there was sort of, you know, negative community reactions to this idea of 
penning your child and, and what that meant about you if you were penning your child. Um, and also um, the impact on women's time. So whereas women would ordinarily just put children down in the on the ground, um, you know, now they would have to, to maintain a nice clean environment, which in, in effect uh, increased the, um, the workload on them. So just to emphasize at this point, no one is calling for an end to WASH. Um, WASH works in a number of different uh, ways to, to improve um, many different things. Um, but what we are now starting to realize is that WASH may not have the desired effect on diarrhea and malnutrition as it was once hoped it, it might have. And in particular, um, it's really revealed that, the, that it leaves out these other transmission pathways um, and in particular the role of animal waste and fecal contamination uh, of food during, during food preparation and also uh, irrigation in the context of fertilizer and so forth. And they've also noted that, you know, while there are calls for this idea of transforming wash, what we don't know is how to do that. So how do we actually create safe, clean uh, environmental spaces for children in a way that's, um, that's going to reduce the, the infection burden to a level where we see this impact. So I had the privilege of, of um, traveling to Zimbabwe and, and joining a workshop with the SHINE organizers. And uh, the result was we published a paper on putting the A in WASH, so capital A, A being animals. And we brainstormed the approach to taking this area forward. So how can we um, you know, really come up with evidence to support interventions around the need to put A in WASH? And this was the framework that we developed. It was around um, establishing microbial carriage and health and the relationships between those using this in-depth analysis of, of, of specifically what types of pathogens are, are causing impacts on health, where are they coming from? And then documenting the transmission pathways. So how are children being exposed to these pathways? And then thirdly, understanding the more social context in terms of what are the types of interventions that could be trialed um, largely through understanding community um, acceptance and ideas around what could be done in this, in this specific context, uh, and then obviously testing them. And just to highlight one study that I think really exemplifies the need to incorporate all three areas is the CAGE study in Ethiopia. Um, so this uh, had a period of formative research. It, the, the objective of this was to go in and test uh, the impact of caging poultry on uh, Campylobacter uh, carriage in children. And so in the period of formative research, they uh, explored, you know, barriers and opportunities for, for these sorts of interventions in largely caging poultry. And they had this cross-sectional component where they were um, measuring child and environmental samples for Campylobacter and also um, doing anthropometry. And the results of this study show, you know, confirmed that Campylobacter was carried uh, in very high rates. They confirmed that there seems to be some sort of association with consumption of animal source foods um, and also breastfeeding, which um, possibly relates to contamination, again, environmental contamination of the breast, for instance. But what they found was that the, the Campylobacter species are really diverse and they weren't just coming from poultry. Uh, and in fact, many of them were actually ruminant associated. So any kind of intervention that's directed at poultry may well just completely overlook uh, this other ruminant associated transmission pathway. So they've gone back to the drawing board to try to understand, um, uh, you know, to, to come up with research to better understand the, the reservoirs and transmission pathways so that they can then uh, redesign the intervention. So this is the last slide, but just um, if there were time to, to discuss and where I think as a community of practice, we need to be going with this area. It's how do we put the animal in wash? Um, to date, most of the people that have been engaging in this area have been people who've engaged with WASH, have strong experience in, in running um, trials directed at this public health intervention, and they don't have a lot of experience implementing uh, interventions on the animal side. Um, so what's in our toolkit that we could offer to this space? Um, how can we promote community acceptance of livestock interventions in ways that perhaps public health public health practitioners might not be able to do um, through linking to, to value chains and increased productivity and so forth. 
um, also of particular relevance to heal? Um, would we have different approaches to sedentary versus mobile populations? I suspect we would. And the other, I think, big area of questions is around how do we test and measure the impact of these? Um, I think as an epidemiologist, I've increasingly questioned whether randomized controlled trials are, are suitable. They were a method that developed around, you know, pharmaceutical interventions. You give a treatment and you measure an outcome. It's fairly straightforward. And even moving into population level studies, that becomes a little bit more complicated. But moving into something where you're exploring malnutrition and health and disease in children across this very complicated pathway, even more complicated still. So now if we add interventions on agriculture, um, you know, value chains or, or uh, microbial contamination in environment stemming from animals, it becomes all very complicated. And I personally don't feel confident that I know that an, R an RCT, um, that I can design an RCT that would really um, answer those questions. So my, my broader question here is, do we have, do we need new tools for studying these really complex and cross-sectoral pathways? So that uh, was where I was going to leave it. Barbara, do I hand it back to you? Yes, thank, thank you very much. Uh, oh, okay, so the video is coming back on. Yeah, thanks a lot, Chiwon. I, I think that was a really fascinating overview. <laughs> thank, thanks a lot for all this information. I, I think even people that haven't maybe looked into us very closely got a, got a really good idea what, what the issues are. So I, I would like to, to open this for, for questions um, from the participants today. And I've seen um, we had a first reaction from Brian. Brian, you want to go ahead with your question? Um, th thank you very much, Barbara. And Siobhan, how very fascinating talk and how nice to uh, to see you and, uh, and listen to you. Now, I, I just wrote a, a rather simplistic uh, suggest you know is it as a variety of different emerging intensifying value chains in, in a whole lot of different uh, different regions is the food safety the uh, the obvious entry point I mean as people are looking at a quality to meet different markets and uh, and, and local communities becoming more remote, is the attention of food safety uh, the obvious entry point, but I'm not quite sure what you, the tools in your toolbox are that would help you uh, address that. So, yeah, good question. Um, so the food safety side of things that have been explored within the context of baby wash, as I say, is primarily through uh, expanding mother's awareness of safe food um, preparation. Uh, so far, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a lot, you know, within this wash sector to to think about interventions that are that are existing at that broader level. Um, if we take a you know high income country kind of approach, you know, we have a whole range of, of ways that we think about food safety. HACCP being a major one, um, and we look across the value chain and think about different intervention points that would reduce the pathogen load at different points along that value chain. At the moment, and, and given the way that the that value chains are structured here, you know, that the plausibility of, of, of having that sort of table to, sorry, farm to fork kind of approach in lower income countries is a little bit harder, I think, because food is localized in terms of, of, of its production in many in many cases and so forth. So, so yeah, I, I think the toolkit is is still learning from what we we know from high income countries, but somehow trying to, to figure out how we adapt um, that. And in fact, you know, some uh, where high income high income countries might be particularly important might be, you know, high interest in vaccines and and um, you know other tools to reduce the, the microbial carriage of of animals in, you know, feedlots and so forth. Um, it makes me wonder if if we would ever get to a point where we could actually vaccinate animals with the view to having the microbial load in their feces decreased. Um, that's decades off, I'm sure. But but that would be that's why I'm saying I think we have different tools in our toolkit that aren't available just to public health practitioners. Okay. Yeah. Leave it there. Yeah. Th thanks for that. Um, is there a follow-up question from your side, Brian? 
No. Okay. Um, not no, not really. It's okay. just that uh, the, the, it is. A, a, you've explained it. It's adapting the, the this, this toolkit to be more appropriate for for the sort of settings that uh, that you're focusing on. So yeah. clearly, I, uh, yeah, and the appropriateness of them. I I am. I, I hope I'm not putting anybody on the spot here, but but I, Christina, I, I would like to come back to the comment that you made that, that you also sort of have realized in, in the work under the under Areca, um, but also on, on, in the build project that, that you have realized to, to capitalize the A in WASH. Um, and so now that we're sort of trying to, to see sort of what should be in this toolkit, is there any any experiences you can share from from the initiatives you're involved in? Hi, uh, Barbara, and uh, thanks, Yuban, for the really nice talk. And um, well, I don't know the toolkit in in detail, but what we're doing in Uganda, for example, uh, we use the WASH protocol uh, for uh, training meat handlers on. Uh, the five keys of safe food and uh, and we're including um, some social perspectives okay. um, like um, we're studying what drives the behavior of meat handlers and that's the animal uh, interface mm -hmm. uh, the meat as a source of contamination and we're studying how uh, uh, the, the meat handlers understand microbial contamination often you know what you don't see is not there basically so we're trying to include concepts of um, of uh, um yeah microbiology or yeah just making the invisible visible and then adopting uh, the the wash uh, framework to training these meat handlers and we are also studying on what what entry points we can use um, around these meat handlers for um, actually changing behavior. They, one, one thing is being aware of all these transmission pathways and the good practices they should observe, but they need constant reminders. So we are trying to study the use of, of nudges, like visualization um, uh, to, to, to motivate yep. handlers. I'm sorry. No. And in, in Mali, uh, this is more a really straightforward WASH initiative uh, led by Stanford University, where IRI is bringing in the, the, animal, um, the animal perspectives. And I think they're working with the same framework and toolkit and trying to um, yeah, get the animal um, component okay. into the WASH concept. Yeah, sorry. Okay, thanks for that. So I, I think it sort of shows there is, is, is it's different initiatives that try to look into this and, and try to also maybe enrich the, the tools that, that are available. So I think this is really an area to, to follow in, in the coming years. I, Barbara, I sort of can have I just see, make a bit yeah, of an addition yes, just to sure, say yes. within you know the WASH setting, the impression I get is there are sort of different communities of, well, not, not different communities of thought, there are different scales, right? So. One is around that household um, scale and, and um, you know, the kinds of behavior changes and so forth that can be implemented at the household level versus um, the community uh, sort of approach. So, so the, the approaches that, um, you know, that whole of system sort of, of side of things that works obviously at the community level. Um, but at the end of the day, if you've got households that, um, you know, still don't prepare food adequately or children are still um, interacting with the environment such that they're going to pick up um, uh, microbes, then interventions at the slaughterhouse or, or whatever would not translate into, um, you know, or be seen to translate into an impact on of, of washes. So, so I think, uh, like Christine is absolutely great in thinking of, sorry, absolutely correct in thinking of that whole of, of system sort of approach, um, something like an intervention at the abattoir level um, or at the processing level or whatever would, would overall reduce microbial contamination. But the degree to which WASH communities would accept that as being relevant to um, to WASH, I, I wonder. Okay. Uh, and, here, and here I think that's a, a bit of a challenge to, to get these two communities to be working together. Okay, so something we all will, will have to, to contribute in the future. I'm, I'm just wondering, we, we also have lots of colleagues um, that 
have a lot of projects on the ground, thinking of VSF colleagues, but also colleagues from Trocare, CCM. I know you all have been involved in, in WASH initiatives and, and have experience in that regard. Um, so I wonder if there's any, any reactions from your side or any experiences that you could share, maybe also trying with, with efforts to also bring in uh, livestock um, issues. Or where you um, I'd like to come possible. in, please, Barbara. Yeah. Yes, please go ahead, uh, Paul. Paul from Trucker. Uh, look, absolutely fascinating, and thank you so much, Siobhan, for an excellent presentation. Uh, we do wash in significant amounts of wash in Ghetto, um, which is in, in South Central Somalia and Jubaland. Um, and we found it to work. I mean, we don't just deal with families. We try, I mean, if you have people walking 27 kilometers to get water and that water is contaminated, you've got real issues. So we do address community issues, treat, treating wells and doing community understandings, uh, you know, a, a real focus on communities taking on responsibility around sanitation. But to be honest, even though Throker as an organization globally is very interested in, in environmental, animal and, and human health, we focused in Somalia very much on human health and, and we run the main medical centers in Ghetto. But I'm really interested in how to connect our wash um, component into our human health component and potentially um, environmental and animal health component. I don't know what the answers are, but I certainly, mm -hmm. this is the first time I've been hearing about the impact of uh, microbial contamination from animals. And our focus is particularly on children under five and they are sitting down eating dirt. Uh, that's yeah. important. Um, and par part of a child's uh, immunity uh, strength. But obviously there are factors in that and I, I'm just interested to know how we can uh, not just put the animal in, in wash, but I link it up a little bit more closely. And thankfully I've been in conversations with BSF Switzerland in relation to maybe looking at that in the future, but fascinating. I'm hoping to get some of the documentation that has been presented here, or at least the slides, so we can further that um, and make it make make inroads onto it in terms of I would be focusing on um, community influencers, wash uh, volunteers. So we already have female community influencers working on um, human health, but also I think there there could be room for expanding our knowledge around that so that um, engagement with the community is a little bit more. Um, it, it takes more account of other issues such as this. So thank you, really, really fa fascinating. Excellent. Thank you so much for, 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 for these insights as well. Um, so, so I've seen there's been a few comments about availability of slides and, and also with the seminar. So the seminar is, has been or is being recorded and it can then be followed on, on the YouTube channel that we have from the HEAL community of practice on the HEAL website. Um, so that will be available there and, and we can also share the slides there. So, so that should be, um, should be easy to, to be accessed in the future. Are there any other uh, comments in regards to, to how to put the capital A into WASH in terms of the toolkit from, from others who have worked in these areas? Any, any experiences anybody would like to share or any other questions? Because otherwise, I, I was also I've seen the comment from Isabel who sort of comments on on she wants questions about how can we test and measure impact. Uh, Isabel, you wanna you wanna expand on on what you've written in the chat on that. You're you're a bit far away, I think. Can you hear me now? Can you a little bit better. Okay, so basically also sort of agree that, that uh, a randomized control trial might be difficult in, in this situation. Okay, and then also the, yeah, the suggestions to, to think about the theory of change and then maybe find points to monitor changes there and, and use that. I think that does make sense. Okay, if there are no other comments or questions, 
give you a few seconds. Then, um, yes, then I, I, I think we're coming for, to an end for today. I'm, thanks again, Siobhan, for this really fascinating talk today um, and for the great presentation. I, I think really everybody has, has enjoyed this a lot and, and has gained a lot from that.